BBC Two, a history file with the story of Magna Carta. The effigy of William Marshall, first Earl of Pembroke. In his time, the most powerful of the English barons. And lying beside him, his son, William Marshall Jr. In the year 1215, England faced civil war, and these two, father and son, took opposite sides. Why? Why? Because my father chooses to remain loyal to an evil king. We have risen in rebellion and our cause is just. For King John is the very worst of men. A murderer, a thief who has bled England dry. We barons fight for peace and for the ancient freedoms that this king has trampled underfoot. Oh, poppycock. You barons fight because you're so hot-headed and power-hungry you've forgotten your sense of duty. John is our sovereign lord. I know it's become a national sport to blame him for every misfortune, but he's not your whipping boy, he's your master. And frankly, we barons are hardly spotless, always been a grasping bunch, always feathering our own nests. It's time we learned some respect and stopped playing with fire. Two ways of seeing this crisis. But which view's more accurate? Who was to blame? Rebel barons? or an evil king. A king should be glamorous, charming, warlike, adventurous, as skilled a fighter as any in the land. Well educated, yes, of course. Shrewd and clever, quick to find new ways of doing justice. And he should be fond of hunting. So, the ideal medieval ruler. How did King John shape up? Not so good. That's if you believe the chroniclers. Foul as it is, hell is itself made fouler by the presence of King John. He was a tyrant, not a king. A destroyer, not a ruler. He was monstrously cruel. When he was angry, he was hardly recognizable. His brow twisted, his eyes burning, his cheeks blue. He'd claw the air like a madman. He even boasted he was descended from a she-devil, that that explained his temper. Worst of all was his godlessness. Do you remember when he let a murderer walk free because he'd killed a priest? He has killed an enemy of mine, he said. Let him go. The verdict of the chroniclers has become the verdict of history, that King John was an ungodly monster. But did he deserve this reputation? Oh, poppycock. Poppycock, poppycock, poppycock. Excuse me, but I remember clearly John issuing orders that anyone found killing a priest should be strung up from the nearest oak tree. He was a very godly man. Well, of course, the Chronicles won't say so. You could hardly expect them to. They were all written by monks. Perhaps one should explain. King John and the Pope had a few disagreements along the way. Who should pick the new archbishop? You know, usual story. So the Pope damns John and declares all the churches will close. All the priests are to go on strike. No services, no weddings, no funerals. Well, of course, it doesn't bother John. He just sends his men in to run the abbeys, ends up making a small fortune, and for years the clergy are out of a job down the taverns picking up bad habits. Well, good for John, I say. Shows them what's what. But, of course, come the day the monks sit down to scribble out the chronicles, guess who gets cast as the villain? So what facts do we know? There's evidence to suggest John was well-read, that he enjoyed hunting and bathing and feasting, especially on lamprey, a type of eel. He'd travel his kingdom tirelessly, sitting in justice, there'd never been a king so keen on the job of ruling. But the king couldn't rule alone. Beneath John were the barons, 200 of them in all, 
local lords, men of great power, how well were they performing their duty? Do you like my robe? Finest brocade. Do you think I'm showing off? I'm not showing off. I'm a baron, a grand seigneur. I have 18 armed knights placed on my land across this country. De Colville in Yorkshire, Fitzgerald in Wiltshire, John of Early in Somerset. They are my supporters, my vassals. I snap my fingers, they bow. You think I should dress as a peasant? I know the value of dressing the body. I dress well in order to be loved, to be feared, to be served. And if the robes grow thin, I cast them aside or place them on the shoulders of some bright young hopeful and so buy his obedience forever. William Marshall and his fellow barons owned two-thirds of the land of England. They lived in castles, they ran private armies. And though they ruled only in the king's name, locally they were as powerful as kings and they expected their supporters to treat them accordingly. We hear our Lord Marshal, the Earl of Pembroke, will be visiting again. His company is good, he is a man of great courtesy, but the expense is very great. We must find sufficient food and drink that his knights and servants might have honorable meal. And I must find two wax candles to burn before him and each candle must be of one pound's weight. There's much fat wasted there. And then I must pay his pantler, his butler, his usher, his cook, his chamberlain, twelve pence each. Sometimes giving service, doing homage, is a great burden. Giving service, doing homage, was central to medieval life. People were tied in a chain of patronage and influence from king to baron to knight to peasant. Entertaining your lord was one way of showing respect. There's duck and fowl and wild boar's head and bucktail broth in trencher bread and split-backed kids and quartered swans and lark and linnet sugared bronze. Each plate would feed a dozen men. The cost is quite beyond my ken. But still it comes, the rabbit stews, the custard sweet and pastry shoes, until at last we belch, retire, and hit the sack with bowels on fire. But there was more to a baron's life than just touring his lands and feasting at his followers' expense. With privilege and status came obligation. The baron had a duty to look after his people, to administer the law, to follow the rules of chivalry. Honor the church, fight against treachery, protect the poor from injustice, and keep the peace in your domain. In the great halls of manor houses across the country, barons heard pleas and sentenced criminals. Their word was law all the more reason to worry should their power ever go to their heads. Oh, oh, I must protest that how my lord doth abuse us. He, he takes a cut of all the goods that cross his lands. He's breaking custom, and it's not right. How often did barons abuse their position? It's hard to tell. But when King John came to the throne, those old enough remembered how the barons could behave at their worst. William Marshall was just a boy. Order had broken down, and the barons had run riot. They forced the wretched people to build them castles. They raised taxes, except they called it protection money, and anyone who didn't pay was thrown in prison, men and women alike, and tortured till they'd say where their gold was hidden. Such tortures. The country has never suffered greater misery. King Stephen, who ruled during these grim, chaotic years, had lost control of over half the country. The barons squabbled amongst themselves because they lacked a king to focus their loyalty. King John's reign was peaceful by comparison. But did that mean his barons were any more loyal to him? Take the year 1204. King Philip of France has invaded Normandy an English province where many barons held valuable estates. 
to beat Philip back. John calls on his barons to gather their knights and prepare for battle. But the barons have other ideas. Listen, father. We have land in Wales, in England, in Ireland, but also we have castles in Normandy. And they are very jewels. We cannot afford to lose them. So we fight for John and defend them honorably. <laughs> Father, you are so old-fashioned. Don't you see? Philip is going to win this war. So what are you saying? I'm saying maybe we should be less fixed in our loyalties. Maybe when Philip's army approaches our gates, we should consider throwing them open. Consider kneeling before Philip, agreeing to serve him in France. John, of course, remains our king in England. That way, we can have our cake and eat it. For John, the war in Normandy was a disaster. And for the English, proud of their warrior kings, John became a laughingstock. Do you know the king's problem? Sheer laziness. Messengers come and tell him, Philip's taken such and such a castle. The king's idling in his tents, enjoying the pleasures of life. He replies, oh, let be, let be, whatever he now takes, I will one day recover. And so, through laziness, the king loses Normandy. But this is just gossip. John fought bravely in Normandy, leading daring raids into enemy territory. But he lacked his baron's support. Castle after castle fell, and in John's eyes, the barons were to blame. He became ever more desperate to show who was in control. The first step was to demand hostages. Troublesome barons must hand over their families to John's safekeeping. It was an old-fashioned custom, but it worked. You are to report to the king forthwith. He doubts my loyalty. He says, Marshal, are you loyal? I say, I am loyal. He says, then bring your knights, fight for me in France. I say, sire, I am loyal in England. In France, I'm loyal to King Philip. He coughs and spits and screams blue murder and demands you as a common hostage so that I might tow the line, curb my pride. But you won't, will you, father? Then John will string me up in my cell and send you my corpse. Don't doubt my loyalty, boy. I made an oath to John. I will not break it. I am loyal. And he'll treat you well, teach you the ways of knighthood. I'll send linen and money for a horse. I was a hostage myself once. I played conkers with King Stephen. Were hostages badly treated? There are reports of hostages serving as ladies and waiting to the Queen, riding on ornamental saddles, receiving gifts of rich material. But not everyone was so lucky. One horror story much repeated was the tale of a certain Matilda de saint Valéry. My husband has fallen from favor, and John will have our boy as hostage. I have told my husband, no. You may beat me about the face in your anger. You may rage and curse me, vow to obey custom, obey John. But I say, no. I said to him, have you forgotten so soon what you told me of John? When you were with him in Normandy, his constant companion, before he grew to mistrust you. How he had the boy Arthur in his protection. Arthur, Count of Brittany, John's rival. And one night his rage burned and he took the boy and strangled him with his bare hands and then weighed down the corpse and threw it in the River Seine. And now you say we must hand our child over as hostage? to suffer this same protection? No, I will not do it. Matilda's husband, William de Brioche, was one of John's leading barons. For refusing to hand over their son, Brioche was hounded into exile. Matilda and the boy were eventually taken prisoner and locked in Windsor Castle. John had them starved to death. But taking hostages was just one way of keeping his barons in check. John demanded his barons pay him one-seventh part of their goods. Enormous sums he taxed them, ever keen to show his royal power, and he would often use violence to enforce his ends. John's aim was to saddle his barons with debt. 
His methods were legal, but they hurt. There were fines for inheritance, fines to quit military service. And when barons died, John could even sell off their wives and daughters. The wife of Walter Firmage is in the gift of the Lord King. She's 24 years old and has land worth 12 shillings a year. Alicia, sister of William d'Aberville, is in the gift of the Lord King. Her land comes with six cows, one bull, 30 pigs and 40 sheep. Many barons found themselves pushed too far. Their authority was being questioned and they'd had enough. The year is 1215. A small but powerful group of barons have raised their standards in rebellion against the king. William Marshall Jr. stands amongst them. What have you done, boy? I am not a boy, father. I am a baron of the army of God. We have risen against John. We've taken London. And though we number just 40 now, more will follow. There's not one baron in England that doesn't nurse some grievance against the king. Will you not join us, father? I have served five kings, though they blundered and faulted. You think John is so bad? John is merely foolish. John has allowed himself to lose your love. Yes, this is poor kingship. But there have been worse. Stephen, whose reign was chaos. Richard the Lionheart, in ten years as king, he was in England just six months. England became a treasury to finance his crusades. John is just unfortunate that my son should rebel. I am ashamed. Both king and rebels were keen for war. But William Marshall Sr. and others found a peaceful solution. The king was to sign the Magna Carta, a charter of rights still regarded as a key document in the protection of individual freedoms. No more shall the king tax the barons large sums for inheriting their lands. There should be trial by jury, for no free man should be imprisoned except by the judgment of his equals. If widows don't want to marry, they shouldn't be forced to. The barons will sit in judgment to make sure the king does not break the terms of this charter. So, had England escaped civil war? No. The barons had what they wanted, recognition of their rights and privileges, but the peace didn't last long. The charter was a waste of time. It solved nothing. But within a year, the rebels were at it again, my son amongst them, to my shame. They invited Philip of France across the Channel to take the throne. Can you imagine? Nearly succeeded, too. John died with his kingdom torn in half, and yours truly far too old for this kind of thing, gallivanting round the country at the head of John's army, trying to pick up the pieces. Although I sometimes wonder if there's anything left worth fighting for. For what is England if the barons have broken their trust? A cancer, that's what. A once proud structure with woodworm nibbling at the beams. So who was really to blame for the crisis? King or barons?